Calling to order the meeting for the Arlington Select Board for Monday, April 5th, 2021. As a pre pre preliminary matter, this is John Hurd, Select Board Chair, permit me, to permit, that, permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan. So Mrs. Mahan is having some audio issues. So once she's able to connect, we'll note that for the record. Steve DeCorsi? Yes. Len Diggins? Yes. Ian Dan Dunn? Yes. Ian Saff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine? Yes. Doug Heim? Yes. And Board Administrator Ashley Mars participating remotely. Good evening. This meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth given the outbreak of the novel coronavirus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation in such, unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Even if members of the public do not provide comment, participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. For this meeting, the select board is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Uh, accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you. Take care to share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please also take care to adjust your screen or device name if you would like to speak in order for us to recognize speakers appropriately. minutes. It is helpful for participants to see your full first and last name when calling upon you rather than a nickname. All the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard, and we recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus, unless the chair notes otherwise. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy, with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. This meeting will feature opportunities for public comment on certain items. After members have spoken, I as chair will afford public comment opportunities as follows. I will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all public commentators, I will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comments. Please keep in mind that all participants and members of the public must be recognized by the chair before speaking. Finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call vote. And Mrs. Mahan, can you hear us now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. So before I go to our proclamation, I will just note that I have had an entirely virtual chairmanship. And so I haven't got to gavel in anything. But for one time, for one meeting, I'm going to use this gavel. And on the top, it says a written original oak from the USS Constitution. And the history of this gavel, if you'll indulge me, is it was first used in the early 1950s from, by Franklin Hurd, then chair of the Board of Selectmen. It was then passed on to Frank Hurd in the early 1990s when he was chair. Then in the year 2000, it was used by my father, Jack, when he was chair. So they did want to have a little ceremony, but they never had an opportunity in the chamber. But I did want one opportunity to be able to gavel in with the same gavel that the four predecessors of my name use as chair of the select board. So with that done, we'll move on to our proclamation. 
We have one proclamation, proclamation to declare April 5th to 9th Community Development Week in Arlington. Ms. Chaplin, do you want to talk about this before I read it or do you want me to just read it? I'll give just a quick uh, uh, 10 seconds on it. Um, this is nationally the week that we celebrate Community Development Week, uh, focused on celebrating not just community development in general, but specifically community development block grants and the, the really great good that they've brought to the Arlington community and communities across across the nation. Um, as you'll read in the proclamation, over the 46 years, Arlington's received uh, approximately $56 million in grant money from this program. And that's funded critical public services, affordable housing production, improvements to public facilities and their accessibility, uh, many, many planning efforts. And again, it's really been a tremendous asset to the community. This week, uh, though normally we would have a day where we would visit sites that benefit um, either through their programming or maybe even through their construction from community development um, block grant money, we're not able to do that because of the pandemic. But on Thursday, this Thursday the 8th at 5 p.m., we'll be doing an online virtual panel <laughs> with the planning department, Arlington Eats, and Food Link to celebrate community, develop, uh, community development week. And for those uh, two groups to really talk about how they've benefited from the CDBG funds in helping reduce food insecurity in Arlington. Thank you. I will read the pro proclamation. Whereas the week of April 5th to 9th, 2021 has been designated as National Com Community Development Week by the National Community Development Association to celebrate the Community Development Block Grant Program and whereas the CDBG program provides annual funding and flexibility to local communities to provide decent, safe, and affordable housing, a suitable living environment, and economic opportunities to low and moderate income people, and whereas over the past 46 years, our community has received a cumulative total of $56,591,974 in CDBG funds, and whereas each year, affordable housing and affordable housing rehabilitation activities, public activity, public service activities, public facilities and improvements activities and economic development activities are funded. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town of Arlington designates the week of April 5th to 9th, 2021 as National Community Development Week in support of this valuable program that has made tremendous contributions to the viability of the housing stock infrastructure, public services, and economic vitality of our community. Be it further resolved that our community opposes any attempts to eliminate the program and urges Congress to recognize the outstanding work being done locally and nationally by CDBG and by supporting CDBG in fiscal year 2022, which is this is signed by the five members of the select board. With that, uh, Mr. Corsi. Yeah, I'll uh, move approval of the proclamation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And Mrs. Mahan? I'll second that. Thank you. And any additional comments, Mr. Diggins? Um, no additional comments, other than they do great work. Thank you. Mr. Dunn? No comment. Thank you. All right. With that, we have a motion to approve. Attorney Ivan? Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's a unanimous vote. <clears throat> and that takes us to our consent agenda. Appointment of new election workers. Agnes Bayer Kiss, Bree Wheeler Lane, unenrolled, precinct 15. John Donato, 16 Homer Road, Democrat, precinct 8. Erin Creter, 22 Tower Road, Democrat, precinct 8. Samantha Lockery, 110 Pearl Street, Woburn, unenrolled, precinct 20. Do we have a motion to approve, Mr. Dunn? So moved. And Ms. Diggins? Second. Any additional comments, Mr. Corsi? No questions or comments. And Mrs. Mahan? No questions, thank you. And we have a motion to approve, Attorney Hein? Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCorsi? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. Appointments. First, we have the Arlington Historic District Commission. Do we have 
the second Mr. Dunn with us. I don't see him. Listen, no, I don't believe he's with us. All right, so this is for Matthew Dunn, Central Street Historic District, term to expire June 30th, 2024. Um, do I have a motion to approve from a member of the board and then we can invite Mr. Dunn back to introduce himself? Um, approval. And a second? Second. All right, and any additional comments, Mr. DeCourcy? Uh, no comments. For Ms. Diggins? Uh, no comments. We're really looking forward to meeting him. Yeah. All right, Chair Howe, we have a motion to approve Mr. Dunn. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Chair, I should have said this beforehand, but just to reflect, there, there's no uh, relation between me and the other Mr. Dunn. <laughs> no, no, dude. All right, now, next on appointments, we have two appointments to the LGBTQIA plus Rainbow Commission. We have Molly Blah Gillis and Carrie Sesportis. Would you like me to bring both of them up, Mr. Chair? Yes, please. We lose. Uh, let me see. There's a Her name is appearing twice in the attendees list. Let me try the other name as well. Hi. Hi. If you could just tell us your name and a little bit about yourself and why you wanted to be on the commission. Oh, sure. My name is Molly Blau Gillis. I'm a, a nearly 10 year resident of Arlington with my husband and our two kids who we're raising here in the town. We love Arlington, love Arlington Public Schools. Um, I'm very be proud to be a part of this community. Uh, my daughter happens to be transgender, and that's what led me to get involved with the Rainbow Commission. Uh, I find it to be a really fantastic group that provides really important connect connectivity in the community uh, for the LGBTQIA plus uh, community within Arlington. Uh, I'm passionate about the schools. I'm passionate about the Rainbow Commission. And I'm really excited about the work that we can do together to create um, you know, greater inclusion and diversity in the schools, which is already, by the way, the schools are already doing really important work in that area. Um, but I guess what I'd like to say is that my daughter, you know, she transitioned her kindergarten year um, here in Arlington Public Schools. And it was largely a really positive experience for her and our family because of the care and support that we received within the school. Teachers, administrators, staff, both principals really provided um, a ton of, of community for us and care that went into that experience. And, um, you know, I'd really like that experience to be uh, the rule, not the exception. Uh, and I think that uh, you know our family and, and my experience might be helpful to other other families in the community. Thank thanks for thanks for having me. By the way, thank you. And Ms. Sesbors, you can just tell us a little bit about yourself as well and why you wanted to serve on the commission. Sure. Hi, um, I've been an Arlington resident for 16 years. Um, I live here with my partner of 22 years. Um, I'm excited to be a part of the Rainbow Commission um, because of the work um, on intersectionality, inclusivity, um, belonging, and community building. Um, that's something I have a passion for. I work uh, professionally in the field of public health. Um, I do public health emergency preparedness planning and operations. Um, and I think this past year has shown us that there's a lot of um, health inequities and, and still barriers to inclusion for people and barriers to accessing services. So that's part of why I uh, want to join the commission and uh, really driven to do this work. Thank you. Now I'll turn to the board, Ms. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will motion approval um, for both candidates and, and, and um, 
and I'd also like to add uh, 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 to Ms. Gillis, I mean, uh, it is, I mean, for all the problems in the world, and we certainly have you know, a long ways to go, it's because of the fact that we have parents like you that uh, it's really easy Er, to be hopeful about about the future because I, mean, I think I mean, it shows that we've come a long way. But but uh, you will help kids you know who are very different and um, feel that you know they are a part of um, a vital part of this world. And so I really appreciate in uh, the role that you play. And and uh, I've seen you at um, some of the meetings, so it'll be great interacting with you some more. And um, uh, uh, and to uh, Carl Sisportis, sorry yeah. for messing up the last name. You know, uh, welcome aboard. You know, and and uh, I have noticed uh, that one of your um, presentations or papers is on community resilience and emergency preparedness. Uh, it was done in Cambridge. I mean, that's that's a very relevant topic, and, and uh, I'd like to not only work with you with the, um, with the commission, but also um, uh, see if there's something that we can help us with in um, our uh, mutual aid. Um, pods that we have going on in town. So it'll be uh, great to have more access to you through the commission. So thanks to both of you for joining. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll second Mr. Diggins motion. I, I wanna thank both Ms. Gillis and Ms. Ms. Fortis for your willingness uh, to serve and, and, and um, for your presentations this evening and, and uh, looking forward to, to having you serve on the commission. Mrs. Mahan. Um, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to uh, Ms. Gillis and Ms. Uh, Sansportis, Molly and um, Terry, thank you for giving extra time away from your family and away from your location um, to serve the town of Arlington, to um, recognize that all kids are kids um, and all people are people. And, and we, we should look at it that way. And um, that's what we really strive to. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative that you're, you both are willing to serve in this capacity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you very much for serving, uh, for volunteering. Uh, volunteers are what make the, make the town work and I really appreciate it and it's a great committee. Um, I was a liaison for a while and uh, I miss it a little bit. Maybe someday I'll convince uh, somebody to appoint me to it. <laughs> Talk to you all, thank you. I don't think it would take much convincing. Thank you both again, like my colleague said, for your willingness to serve. You know, this is a really critical commission that the board, our board relies a lot on, and the town relies on it with the intersection with the school department. You know, it, it's really, it's it's a time commitment, but we do appreciate your, your willingness to serve in this critical role. So thank you. With that, Attorney Heim, we have a motion to approve. This is Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurt. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And that takes us to item number six in the agenda, licenses and permits for approval, common victualler and wine and malt license. Taraya Japanese Restaurant, 795 Massachusetts Avenue, Shinji Maraki. Yeah, Mr. Meraki. Oh. Yeah, I was gonna almost instinctually uh -huh. attorney Leone was with us too, but <laughs> it's alcohol. Why wouldn't I be here? He has his attorney hat and then the where's Second hat and two agenda items. That's, All right. Thanks, please. Everything went for I could, Mr. Um, if I could, Mr. Chair, I've had to step away a second time now. Um, my husband's not home, and my colleagues are aware of my family situation, and I've had to step away very briefly um, to get that under control. And I don't mean any disrespect to my colleagues or people before us, but. Um, I've had to do that, so I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No problem. Attorney Leone? Good evening. Um, I'm here tonight with um, Sinji Maraki and um, Bob Foster. 
uh, Mr. Meraki is the owner and operator of Toraya Restaurant, who was located in the shopping mall across from the high school that's now been demolished. He wants to reopen in the former Retro Burger location. I think it's 785, 795 Mass Ave. Yep. They were there for almost 20 years, successfully ran that shop. Um, and the entire time they did, they had no alcohol um, violations that I'm aware of or that I was made aware of by the chief, chief of police. And basically, um, he, he's going to open up, uh, I believe, just 19 seats. Is that right, Sin Sinji? I think he's going to have 19 seats in there. So it's yes. just going to be looking for um, wine and malt beverages and a common Vic license to reopen and give us great Japanese food once again. So he's here along with Bob. Bob is the manager, the alcohol manager. He was the alcohol manager for the entire time they were open down at the other location. So with that, um, we all know the shop. And if you have any questions, we'll be glad to answer them for you. Thank you. Mr. Dunn? Uh, I'm happy to move approval. Um, I will say that you know, 20 years of operation is a great track record. And nonetheless, I'll take the opportunity just to remind you that uh, one, when we've had alcohol violations in town, it was most often with a new employee who was not fully trained. And so I just uh, ask that you keep that in mind as you keep your operation and you uh, keep your training up to date so that new employees keep you going for another 20 years without a violation. Thank you. And Mrs. Mahan. Um, I will second that. And um, I would like to um, thank this business and establishment for doing everything they can to stay in Arlington and continue on. And I, I know Arlington will do everything to keep you here as we can. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I also want to echo my colleagues' comments. I was really happy to see that you were able to stay in Arlington um, and, and move not too far from, from where you were previously. And I, I just note, I, I do see an application. It is a 19 seat restaurant and just bear in mind, that's the yeah. minimum for the license. So make sure you maintain that, but uh, happy to, to um, go along with my colleagues uh, on the approval. Ms. Diggins? Yes, um, I also would express appreciation for you staying in town. And I know that my um, colleagues, former work colleagues, but current um, volunteer colleagues at um, ACMI are happy that you're staying. They think you have the best sushi. I agree. Thank you. And I also just want to reiterate what my colleagues have said. And thank you for originally choosing Arlington. And thank you for continuing <coughs> Operate in Arlington. So with that, Attorney Heim, we have a motion to approve. Mrs. Vaughn. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you all. We appreciate oh. it and look forward to it. Ready. That takes us to traffic rules and order and other business for approval. No parking sign at 87 Pleasant Street. Traffic and parking unit police department. Uh, Mr. Chaplain, I know Mr. Officer Rateau is unavailable. Is anybody going to present this or are we just going to go off of his memo? I think if the board is comfortable going off the memo, that would be fine with me. That was. Uh, Officer Rateau had reached out to the South Board office and, re and relayed this question to me. He was un he's not available to be at the meeting, but his memo, I think, speaks for herself. Um, so if the board is comfortable and so inclined, we can field a motion to approve this. Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'll move approval. And, and just a historical note, 87 Pleasant Street is actually the Governor Brackett house and Governor Brackett built the house in 1887 and the bracket school is named after him. So we don't, uh, we'll probably never get an opportunity to talk about it again. So I just wanted to bring that up as part of my motion. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. Wow, learn something new every meeting. I'll second that. Uh, and, and also I'll say, I'm happy to see a, this happening uh, because I think there are other places in town where this can happen. And, and when the sustainable transportation plan is finalized, and I think uh, we will 
we'll endeavor to to explore how to make the town safer by doing this in more locations. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Dunn? No comment, thank you. And Mrs. Mahan? No comment, thank you. All right, and Ms. Knott, Attorney Hyman, we have a motion to approve. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Do you unanimous vote? Thank you. Item number eight on our agenda, discussion vote authorization for remote annual town meeting, April 26, 2021. We have Mr. Leone with us. Now we have moderator Leone. Attorney Hyman. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, John, do you want to take it away or do you want me to? Or Mr. Uh, you can start, Doug. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Leone, Mr. Moderator. Um, the board has before it, as it's had both at last year's annual town meeting and the special town meeting in November, a recommendation and request from the town moderator uh, to conduct the annual town meeting scheduled for April 26, 2021 uh, by remote uh, participation. That essentially means that it's gonna be on Zoom alongside or paired with a special voting software from a voting platform from Zpato Research, I believe is the, is the name. Um, Mr. Leone took the appropriate steps, including identifying uh, the platform being recommended for town meetings use, uh, confirming that he's consulted with the Disability Commission or the ADA coordinator, and certifying that the technology has been tested and enables the meeting to be conducted in substantially the same manner. It's not the identical manner, but it's substantially the same manner as we have done for the special town meeting um, uh, previously. The um, Basic steps that need to be taken from here are a vote by the board that the town meeting shall be conducted remotely via the uh, conferencing platform. Um, second, uh, that you approve a notice of which I attached a draft. It didn't make some uh, corrections to some uh, 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 minor uh, issues in it that Mr. Leone spotted. Thank you, Mr. Leone. And um, that we then have to post that notice for 10 days before the start of the meeting. Finally, the town clerk uh, will uh, certify a copy of the select board's vote, as well as the moderator's letter, and uh, send it along to the attorney general's office. So with that, um, I have a draft motion for the board uh, that's the most recent version with is uploaded to Novus. Um, and if you have any questions or you'd like to discuss it all with the moderator, um, I'd be happy to answer them or defer to Mr. Leone. Thank you. that I will turn to the board. Um, Mr. Diggins. Well, I would certainly like to make a motion to approve. I mean, I don't have it in front of me. I can pull it up, but uh, if I need to make the motion in a more uh, detailed way, uh, let me know. Otherwise, um, this is sufficient. I make the motion. I'd be happy to read it if you like. Please. Uh, moved that the town of Arlington Select Board moves as follows. First, pursuant to chapter 92 of the Acts of 2020, having received the written request of the town moderator, John D. Leone Esquire, dated March 25th, 2021, that the April 26, 2021 annual town meeting and any special town meeting conducted within such meeting be conducted remotely via the Zoom tele telephone and video conferencing platform combined with the Zpato research technology as recommended by the moderator. And second, that a notice consistent with the foregoing for remote annual town meeting on April 26, 2021 at 8 p.m. be issued in compliance with uh, chapter 92 of the Acts of 2020 and chapter 39, section 10A. So moved. Thank you. Ms. Dunn? I'm happy to second it and uh, looking forward to another virtual town meeting and uh, looking forward to hopefully it being the last one of that type. Anyway. Second. Mrs. Mahan? Um, I just have um, one worry about too much question. Um, I know there's language in here regarding uh, town meeting voting to pursue by remote participation. Um, and my reading says that at the beginning, there'll be a vote where the town meeting agrees to do that. 
And if it doesn't, then the town meeting is dissolved. So my question is, um, what is that process? I know there'll be a vote um, of the town meeting members who are participating. What is sort of the uh, nexus or what does that vote look like? Like if we did get the doomsday scenario that um, town meeting voted not to proceed that way, what would that look like? Is it a two thirds vote or majority vote or something else? I, I, it's a majority vote, I believe. Um, that's pursuant to the enabling legislation that the governor signed last year, um, authorizing remote town meeting and representative town meetings. We have to get a permission of the of the body to proceed in that fashion. So on the first night before we start, once we do the um, pomp and circumstance, which are going to be limited, I'll just take a quick vote to authorize us to use the VTM as we did last year. And I'm pretty sure we'll get 100% uh, vote back on that or a nearly unanimous vote. I don't think we're going to get a, 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 a negative vote on that at all, just by majority vote. OK, my second question would be, for those town meeting members, whether they're new or longstanding town meeting members that feel they're sort of challenged by the Zoom technology, um, who do I and my colleagues sort of direct them to, to help facilitate them, similar to me, zooming into this meeting tonight, not being able to use my husband's because he's not home yet, uh, mm -hmm. computer and having to do the phone and the laptop of my own. Uh, to whom or what department should we direct them to for guidance on, we can help you zoom into this meeting? Okay, I have sent an email to every town meeting member, and we've also sent it to any potential new town meeting members who may or may not be elected this Saturday. We have two trainings tomorrow and Wednesday of this week to for refresher for the existing town meeting members. We have a mandatory training on the 13th, I believe, Tuesday, Tuesday of next week um, for the new town meeting members. We've also, in coordination with um, Mr. Kowalski, Adam Krawski, is a um, in-person training that he has kindly said he would do that in town hall, but it has to be set up by um, in advance, and they all got a link to go to set up for that half hour, 15 minute training with Adam to be walked through. I don't know if anyone has signed up for that yet. And for the two trainings that are coming up tomorrow and Wednesday, we have 28 town meeting members looking for refresher. So we have a pretty good buy-in so far. So out of the 252, we're only having 28 wanting to come back. So that's a little over 10%. So the only two town meeting members or only two of them I know that don't um, have a computer and I still have to work with them we're going to have them phone their votes in. And we've coordinated with uh, Ms. Brazil, town clerk, in order to coordinate that and how that's going to look. OK, and last, hopefully, brief question. Um, will there be a person de designated from the town or via the town moderator to sort of be the person when the town meeting is happening and you're having, a, you're having trouble connecting or voting there'll be a live person that can address that and that person will be announced and how to uh, reach them yeah that's actually a good question we have um mr dennis lowry he's with the school department he has a staff of four to eight people and depending on how many we need we need more the first couple nights of town meeting and it tapers off as people figure it out their numbers are uh, posted on the town meeting webpage, I believe, or they will be if they're not already. But we also have added a Zoom on the Zoom, um, excuse me, on the um, ZPADO research uh, platform, a get help button now. So they can just click that button and that will connect them up with Dennis and his team. Um, they're really good. They're the guys and gals who work with the kids who have trouble logging on to their um, home classes. So they've really know how to work through and 
hold people's hands at this point. So there are numbers will be there. Resort, and as a last resort, when we start town meeting, will you give that information out if you you know you're trying to mm. connect and you haven't been able to do it? Here's the number you call. Here's the email you yep. email. Yeah, okay, we have their, their numbers will be out and it'll trip down. They, they set up so it trips down to the different people. Worst case scenario is to um, call up and say, this is my phone number and one of them will call you. By the time we okay, finished so last we'll fall connect. special, we had it pretty yeah. much figured out for the, um, the helpline. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No question. All right. Attorney Hyam, we have a motion to approve. that has been second. Ms. Diggins? I just wanted to, um, to add that um, I really appreciate the report that uh, you and Mr. Kowalski uh, did after the survey. I mean, I thought it was a really, really good report. So mm -hmm. I appreciated that. Yeah, we learned a lot from the survey. All right. Attorney Hyam? Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Dickens. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurt. Yes. Unanimous go. Thank you, Mr. Leone. We'll see you all in three weeks. Item number thank nine you. for discussion draft select board report to town meeting. Attorney Heim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to touch base with the board briefly to uh, make sure that I understood the board's uh, intentions based on uh, prior practice in the last couple of years, as well as uh, the some discussions that you've been having with the ARB in both joint meetings and among the chairs recently. So tonight you'll have your uh, final set of uh, final votes and comments for depending on how you decide to look at the one article hearings uh, approved certain uh, articles and then potentially approve all of the final votes and comments, including for those items up for hearing tonight, if you agree with the sort of preliminary draft that I, I composed. Uh, based on the last couple of years, what we have done after that is I've worked with your office to uh, basically proofread and, and go over all the uh, final votes and comments in your report, uh, transmit a draft to you for your individual review that report has traditionally come back after the election um, and uh, any you know changes or major issues have been noted uh, to make sure that you know the report looks uh, in a way that reflects this board and then you know we this board's votes and we would put in a note about whoever the new select board member is not having sort of participated in the discussions in terms of uh, an appendix what we've done in the past, to my recollection, is that we've had um, some information on some detailed CDBG reports, uh, parking benefit uh, expenditures. Uh, this year, there's a couple of uh, special matters, uh, including the uh, Prince Hall resolution. If you're inclined to approve the comment, uh, I thought it might be nice to include uh, Prince Hall's charge uh, to the Lodge of Monotony. Uh, but I also want to make sure that I include anything else that you folks would like to see in the appendix to the report, especially if we haven't done it in years past. So I, I wanted to make sure that that is as a baseline, uh, correct understanding of, of what uh, you folks would like to do to make sure the report is in tip top shape. And then secondly, um, this year, the board is uh, for the first time, uh, in theory, going to uh, provide some uh, opportunity for supplementary comment on certain ARB articles. The ARB is deliberating uh, this evening, and then I believe they're scheduled to finalize their own report next week. Uh, as they do that, there will be an opportunity for the select board to provide uh, what is essentially any supportive comments uh, they, they would want, which I think the ARB invited this board to do. I wanna make sure that this board agrees with the sense that I was contemplating that you would essentially have a little section perhaps at the end of your report saying, you know, boards, uh, the board's comments on uh, ARB articles. Um, so with that, I, I just want to make sure that I'm not missing anything in terms of what you might like to see in the appendix and uh, make sure that you sort of generally 
you, obviously you'll take a vote on it. If you don't want to support or comment on any of the ARB matters that they'd ask for your sort of support on, you don't have to. Uh, but uh, that's how I was sort of envisioning uh, doing it. I want to make sure I execute that properly. Yeah. And Trahan, I don't have it written down in front of me. Do you recall the the article numbers that we had designated at that at our joint meeting for that the ARB is hearing? Uh, the article number has changed a little bit, but I, I, th there's there's probably five or six articles that they have asked for uh, your sort of comment of support on if if the board is comfortable providing that. And yeah. uh, it's a little bit awkward because it'd be hard to do it before their report is ready and they haven't voted yeah. yet. Yeah, well, we'll just we'll circulate that for the board just so they know ahead of time. Of course, and they can start taking a look at the articles. Um, all right, with that, I'll turn to the board for any comments, questions. Motions, Mr. Diggins. So the question is: so we'll be making those comments on the ARB um, articles next Monday. That's a question is through to Mr. Is that, is that, are they going to be done with their hearings by Monday? So they're done with their hearings. They're yeah. deliberating tonight, um, and. I'm not sure that they'll finalize their votes until uh, next Monday, uh, but I think I could have some preliminary sense for the board if you'd like to have it uh, uh, at your sort of post-election organizational meeting. Okay. Mr. Chaplain, does that make sense to you? I'm sorry. It does. It, if, if we still want to accomplish what you're describing, I think timing to be ready for town meeting would require staying on that timeline you've described yep right. yeah all right yeah i'm just trying to understand when when we will make the the comments and then vote on it because we we as a group will want to vote uh on each of them no uh and then or are we just kind of like taking them all and then saying uh, we approve all and, and then i guess i'm at a little loss is how is this going to work I'm sorry, you know. Well, it's, it, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, may I? Yep. It's the first year we're doing it. It, it has been, uh, it, it, the timing of it is proving to be a little bit more tricky than, than I think uh, the boards had anticipated. But I think what I would do is take the uh, planning department sort of draft votes uh, to the ARB and the ARB will be finalizing them. And I think, you know, providing some sort of draft comment from the select board to see if the board is inclined to provide some moment of support. Now, obviously that might be contingent if the ARB changes its position on the articles that it's asking for your sort of support on, uh, as far as the, the planning department understands it, then fine. Uh, but uh, I think what I'll probably do is draft something in conjunction with the planning department's understanding of what those motions are uh, to provide it for context for you. And then you can vote on each one do we want to submit a comment of support for the ARB's position or not? Yeah. All right. You know, no, I'm fine with that. I mean, I just really wanted to be a process where, you know, we really get to deliberate or at least I really get to think about it. And so that we, when I, you know, say I support it, I come from a position of having it thought about it uh, significantly. Uh, so that's where I was coming from on this. So, so I guess now the deal is to make a motion to support this plan of action. I'm happy to do that. Is there any motions that you need at this time, Trahan? I don't need a motion per se. I just want to make sure that I understanding what the board wants to do based on its prior discussions with the ARB and based on its uh, our prior practice with the select board report. I know that the timing of also just the select board straight up report is a little bit awkward because there's going to be an election, uh, but that's my recollection of how we've done it. It's been after the election, the report comes in, we distribute it to all of you to make sure that there's no adjustments that need to be made, not a new fresh discussion, but you know any adjustments that need to be made, make sure that we're including all the materials in the appendices that you want to have in there um, and that you get a, a look and sort of a vote to approve it as a final product. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. I have no, no more questions, thank you. So then? Um, my, I'll just tell you the thing that I thought about that I, but I don't think it, which is, uh, I was thinking about the, for the election 
the the sorry the um, rank choice voting the concept of having an explainer about how the how the process is going to work um, but then I also after thought, thinking about it for a while I wondered if rather than having us do it we should ask the election modernization committee to do it instead because um, you know they've spent a lot more time thinking about it I think than we have so in the end I actually decided that I wasn't going to ask for that but since I was kind of teetering on the edge, I figured I'd share it with the rest of the board in case other people were like, oh, no, Dan, that was actually a good idea in the first place. That's all I got. Other than that, sounds good. And I, of course, will not be here to make those votes, and I'm okay with that. Senator Corsi? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Attorney Heim, for the explanation. That all makes sense to me and, and to Mr. Diggins' point. I think we're just going to have to wait and see what the ARB presents to us. And then if we're comfortable, we're comfortable. We'll have the vote of support. If, if we can't reach consensus, we won't. And, I, and I, I'm with you. I'd like what they have and be able to, to have a discussion on that and, and uh, before we do anything. So um, thank you. And, and for now, I have no further comments or questions. Yep. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess what I would say, uh, two points. Um, to Attorney Heim regarding our report to town meeting uh, in the ARB actions. Sometimes in the past, I felt like um, when a com board com committee or commission had multiple issues to report back on, they sort of didn't do the report until all two, three, four, five um, issues had been resolved. Um, my request would be uh, after tonight when the redevelopment board meets, whatever can be presented to us on the 12th and or um, the 19th through our board agenda information and no later than the 26th. My thing is, I don't wanna, if, if this can happen, that if everything isn't resolved after tonight, what is resolved is held in order to present sort of a package uh, presentation to the board. Um, I'd like to take it piecemeal if possible um, so that uh, we're not getting a lot of information either the week before or the night of town meeting. Uh, so you can kind of resolve and take a vote to uh, agree or have some questions uh, for that. And to my colleague, Mr. Dunn, um, comments. I totally agree. I've gone uh, in, in favor of against, in favor of against ranked choice voting um, uh, for many reasons. And, and I agree with his comments in terms of getting comments from the election moder modernization committee um, and sort of, sort of letting that be not so much the guide, but the uh, drop off point or the I don't know, a uh, launching pad to have that discussion because I've just, I've gone back and forth on this so many times. Um, I think that's a prudent way for us to proceed. So if attorney Heim and the town manager can, whatever comes out of tonight out of ARB that it can get to the select board, we can review and indicate um, how we wanna vote on that. Um, and my big thing is don't hold everything to the end if there's five or six things and one or two of them haven't been resolved yet. If we, if we can clear those three or four, that would be great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yep, and this all looks correct to me. Um, in discussions with the ARB chair, what they look into, we had talked about this as a board and we also talked about this in our subcommittee meeting with the chairs is that they're certainly not looking for any competing motions to and their motion is gonna be put before um, town meeting, but they're just really looking for the board to support the decisions that they've made on a few articles and provides any additional comments that we might have. So I think that should we should be able to easily do this on Monday and just wrap that up so we can wrap this, wrap our report up for, for town meeting. So with that, I don't believe we had a motion. So we can move on. Anything else, Attorney? No, Mr. Chair, I just uh, based on your comments and, and 
Mr. Sohan's comments in the, I don't want to say the worst case scenario, but one alternate uh, case scenario is that the board does a supplemental report rather than folding it into your report, because I know the, your board's office will want to try to get out uh, the main body report as soon as it can. So yep. things aren't ready to go by Monday. We'll, we'll figure it out another way. All right. That takes us to item number 10 on the agenda discussion of the Mugar property. We put this one on here. This came out of neighborhood meetings that me and Mr. Corsi had attended. And, and I know we've had a number of um, emails on this as well, just regarding the, the garbage situation at the Mugar property. There's some loose garbage and loose debris to be picked up. So we asked that Mr. Chaplain to provide us with a plan to retrieve the garbage. Ms. Chaplain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I suppose I'd say a few things. Uh, I think as the board knows, uh, the police department, the Health and Human Services Department in coordination with the Somerville Homeless Coalition uh, have really put forth a great effort to provide services, referrals, um, and, and I guess just general services to those residing in the Mugar Woods. However, um, it is becoming an increasing challenge based on an increasing number of people inhabiting the woods, as well as, um, as the chairman alluded to, uh, a growing amount of trash uh, in the woods attributable to those, to those residing there. So um, in a focused approach to clean up what's there now, we are scheduling a cleanup effort on April 24th on a Saturday. Uh, Chief Flaherty and Officer Kniff, who's assigned to the Homelessness Task Force, uh, are putting that together. Uh, we'll likely be recruiting volunteers from the community to help town staff in undertaking that effort. Uh, we have also, um, as the board knows, the board approved the letter going for me to the Mugars to ask for their assistance. Uh, I was finally able to reach by phone a representative of the Mugar family for a very brief conversation who expressed the potential for some involvement by the Mugar family in supporting a cleanup. Um, I, I then forwarded pictures that Mr. DeCourcy had provided to me, um, demonstrating the pileup of trash on the property uh, and sent that to that same representative of the Mugar family and have yet to hear back. So I'll now follow up now that we have a date um, with that representative to see what type of involvement, either um, people involvement or financial involvement we might be able to get from the Mugar family. So um, and I think the final thing I'll say is in speaking with the chief today, there is an acknowledgement of uh, an, an escalation of concern or an escalation of the challenge on the site based on the number of people um, inhabiting the site and their conduct. And she'll be meeting with her team, the Health and Human Services team, as well as again, the team from the Somerville Homeless Coalition to uh, develop a potentially new strategy for addressing concerns on the property. And once that's developed, I'll have more to share. Um, again, specifically to reiterate back to the issue of the trash, on April 24th, we will mobilize a cleanup to start removing or hopefully remove a good deal of the trash from the site. Mr. Corsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chapter Lane. Um, got a few comments, um, and and I, I appreciate what you just said. I, I think that, that the last week or so that there have been increasing challenges at the site. So I'm glad to hear that there will be a meeting tomorrow. And and um, just so people know, the, that the last cleanup was November 20th. So there hasn't been anything removed from the site since that time. Um, I appreciate the fact that there's a a cleanup scheduled for April 24th, but I, I think the trash that is at the edge of Thorndike Field in particular, as, as well as a, a site that may have been vacated that you can see from Birch Street, as well as a site that you can see from the end of Parker Street, I think that should be cleaned up ahead of time. And, and that's the type of participation I think we should seek from the from the Mugars. And, and, and frankly, I was at Thorndike Field today there are carriages that were put at the edge of the site back in November that are still there. And the Thomas Coalition did direct that some trash be put at the edge of the site near Thorndike that just piled up. And I think that the cleanup on the 24th is maybe more inside the site, it'd be more, more appropriate there. But I, I, I think these areas on the outside, I, I'd like to see something happen this week on it, to be honest with you. And if it's, if it's done, we have to hire a contractor to do it and send Mugar the bill, I'm fine with that. But I, I, I really, with the spring sports starting at Thorndike Field and, and what's piled up there, 
I really think those edges need to be done sooner rather than, than later this month. Ms. Chaplin? Mr. DeCourcy, could, could you just repeat the third? I have the trash at Thorndike, the trash view from Birch Street and the third that you referenced. At, at, at the end of Parker Street. The you can, and, and I don't know if that encampment has been abandoned, but if you go to the end of Parker Street, you can see this, it, it's very visible. Um, and, and those three areas in particular, um, and, and there is a, a great need for the rest of the site and there are other issues that are gonna be addressed tomorrow. But I, I think those three really have to be done soon, meaning like within days, not weeks. Okay, thank you. All right, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I agree with my, what Mr. DeCourcy said, especially in terms of, you know, cleaning the site and, and sending the bills to Peter and Caroline Mueller afterwards. Um, I know that those bills may never been be uh, uh, reconciled, but the other thing I'd like to do is uh, the Board of Health has been outstanding in terms of uh, dealing with the homeless population down there. But I, I'd also like to, if we can, um, and ask the town manager or anyone else to evaluate if there are any steps through penalties or fines um, that the Board of Health can issue um, against the new bars. Again, recognizing they may not pay them, but perhaps it will give us some speed in terms of um, when we're going to state agencies, when we're going to HUD, just sort of add into how unresponsive and um, unaccountable the MUGARs have been with this property that they're trying to super overdevelop. Um, the answer may be no, but um, you know, I, I look to town agents agencies, Conservation Commission, Board of Health, et cetera, that really, you know, the select board really doesn't have any sort of oversight authority, but these other boards and commissions do. So I, I know sometimes people say, well, you know, the Board of Health can issue a penalty or a fine or a, an assessment, but the MU guard's not gonna pay it. My thing is I'd like to issue um, that edict um, because maybe on the off chance it might help us in uh, convincing a state or a HUD agency as maybe another demonstration that might get us over the hump of them actually uh, dealing with the site fairly that is um, being pro proposed for a ridiculous over -develop development. I know I'm reaching, but I'm going to keep reaching. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Uh, I have. I have no additional comment. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do support what Mr. DeCourcy uh, has, has recommended. Um, what do you think, how much is it going to cost? To do what Mr. DeCourcy requested? Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, to, to do the, that quantity of pickup, I, I mean, I, I would guess a couple thousand dollars. Right. Because I mean, the deal is, I mean, I, I think we need to work on keeping it clean, you know, and I think we need to factor that into to our budget, you know, and, and, you know, that's, that's the, that's the cost that we as a town, that we as society, you know, are, are paying me for, for homelessness, I mean, and for I mean the lack of, of mental, providing you know, mental care, mental health uh, for folks, I mean, uh, uh, and, and, and I know if I lived in that area, I mean, I wanted to be clean. And, and I want the town to support me in keeping that clean. Uh, and I say that because I feel that, yes, send the bill, me, but Ms. Mahan is correct I mean, in that. I mean, the likelihood that it's going to be reconciled at least anytime soon is remote. You know, but, but I mean, let's take care of, of the, the people I mean, who live I mean, near there. I mean, uh, I mean they're going to be taking care of themselves because, I mean, they're part of the town. It's coming out the town's budget. But, and I think we should do something can, on a continual basis. That's my recommendation. I mean, I'm not, I'm not dictating that by any stretch. I don't even think it's my place to dictate that, hey, but I'm just giving you my sense of how I would like to see it handled. So that's it, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I thank you for the presentation, Mr. Chaplin. You know, I, I think what we need to do is as Mr. Corsi mentioned is first, take care of the 
piles of trash that people reach out to us about, which are visible, and particularly from the soccer field. We, our residents shouldn't have to see that, but we also have visiting neighbors to our soccer fields that want to show a good face for Arlington. So I, I think, and certainly on the, in the neighborhoods, if we can get those up immediately, then certainly we'll, we'll reach out for a show of hands from some of the people we see before us for volunteers for the 24th, but that'll, that will be a good community effort to try to get people both from the neighborhood and from, you know, all aspects of town to, to join in the effort. Uh, so we'll look forward to that one as well. All right, so with that, do we have a motion to receive? I don't think, I don't know if there's any motion that we need, but. All right, with that, we'll just move on. Ms. Chaplin. All right, that brings us to warrant article hearings. Articles for review, article 25, home rule legislation, real, real estate transfer fee, home rule, article 27, Revolving funds, Article 52, endorsement of parking benefits district expenditures. First, Article 25, Home Rule Legislation, re real estate transfer fee. Do we have anyone to present on this, Ms. Chaplain? Or Attorney Ham? Yep. Go Thank ahead. you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm presenting on this article tonight uh, on behalf of representatives of the Housing Plan Implementation Committee. I've been briefed fairly extensively by the planning director, Ms. Rage, who's obviously at the ARB's hearings uh, tonight, um, as well as Ms. Osorico. Uh, the recommended vote in front of you is supported by uh, language from HPIC, which reads a little bit like a cross between a, a resolution and then a vote. Uh, the resolution sort of piece of it explains the rationale behind it. And then the vote I've sort of translated into a proposed vote uh, in a vote and comment that you guys should have received. They also provided an FAQ um, and some other supporting documentation. If the board would like, I can run uh, very quickly down the sort of general purpose and features of the real estate transfer fee as the um, uh, Housing Plan and Petition Committee has recommended it. Sure. So uh, what's before you is really a uh, a table setting measure in the sense that the any vote that this board takes or town meeting that takes would basically be to submit special legislation that would have to go then get approved by the legislature and signed by the governor and then go on a local ballot to be approved before any real estate transfer fee would actually take effect. So again, the board's making a recommendation on a vote for this proposal from HPIC. Town meeting would have to approve it. It would have to get passed by the legislature and then would ultimately get put on a ballot uh, to Arlington voters to uh, before any real estate transfer fee would be assessed. The features of the way that HPIC has designed this is a little bit different from uh, some of the many communities in the surrounding area, uh, Concord, Somerville, some of these other uh, folks who have proposed real estate transfer fees that are either sitting in the legislature now or will be there soon. Um, they're essentially recommending that this board have discretion to set a real estate transfer fee at between 0.5 and 2% of any real estate transfer that is over a certain dollar amount. And they want you also to have the discretion to set what that dollar amount would be, but in no event would that dollar amount um, be uh, less than the state median sale price for the entire city of Massachusetts. So right now, recently, the, the, the median sale price uh, for the statewide was $445,000 um, for, uh, for, for a transaction. Uh, therefore, the board could set a real estate transfer fee for anything above that. And the board would, again, have discretion to say it's 0.5% all the way up to 2%. You couldn't go above that, and you couldn't go below that. The next feature also gives this board discretion to decide who's gonna pay. Is it gonna be the buyer? Is it gonna be the seller? Or is it gonna be some combination of both? Uh, there's some real estate uh, professionals who would know better than I would. Practically speaking, uh, it's likely that the buyer is going to absorb some amount of that no matter who pays. But, but there are versions of this where the seller has borne all the responsibility, 
the versions where the buyer bears all the responsibility and there are versions of it where it's some combination of the two. Uh, they would prefer for the, uh, uh, as part of the affordable housing trust action plan, for there to be some recommendations made to you on all of these scores before you ultimately decide uh, how you wanna sort of sort out those three elements. What the actual rate of the fee is gonna be, the threshold that triggers the fee and how it's divvied up. Uh, finally, uh, it's important to note that there are a whole lot of exemptions. Probably the biggest category of exemption that I don't wanna gloss over is that if you transfer a uh, property to somebody for $100 or even for $1 because you're transferring it to your spouse or your uh, children, that's not gonna trigger the real estate transfer fee because that's under $445,000. Uh, but there's also going to be a further exemption um, for a lot of different types of transactions between immediate family members, uh, anything involving um, affordable housing, like the housing authority or housing corporate farming pin, because the affordable housing trust might be helping to facilitate certain uh, new developments of property. And sometimes those things can change hands um, as a part of that process between different uh, developmental corporations. Um, the sort of uh, other sort of half of this is, is the why. The why is uh, to develop a steady stream of income to support the town's goals of creating affordable housing. So uh, the planning department has provided a chart that I believe I included in your in the memo to you that sort of highlights how much revenue you could expect under the real estate transfer fee set at different uh, permutations of these rates and uh, minimum thresholds for transfer price. Um, but it would be a steady revenue stream that is totally separate from the rest of the town's revenue. So you're not taking it away from anywhere else in order to help find affordable housing. Uh, with that, I think that's probably a, a relatively uh, 500 foot view summary. If there's uh, more detailed questions or um, issues that I can address, uh, I'm open to the world. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, okay. <laughs> um, here's my initial thoughts on this. Um, I'm thinking about what we've presented to the voters in the tax pays of our Um We've had debt exclusions including the current one for the high school. We've had consistent overrides. We've had Community Preservation Act. And yet again, here we're talking about another tax um, burden increase. Um, I, I understand the objective to um, get monies um, to this affordable housing trust. Um, but I think you know, as Charlie Foskett says, because I said to him, um, some people, which include my husband, um, kind of feel like the town of Arlington considers them as a personal ATM. So my first question would be in terms of the Recovery Act and the funding that this program needs and the monies on the town side, which is separate from the school side, which they will probably know in about two weeks, um, which we have to budget between now and 2024. I'm, I'm trying to look at a way to avoid yet again, putting another tax on uh, people, whether they're selling or buying in Arlington, would it be a viable option to, uh, instead of creating this new tax to buyers or sellers, um, would it be appropriate? And I, I know when, uh, Jenny Rate and Erin Zerko presented to the Finance Committee. Um, it was well received, but in terms of who would pay for it, what's the viability of instead of imposing an additional tax, um, perhaps being able to factor that into the 30, approximately 36.7 million recovering funds that have to be budgeted between now and 2024? I don't know if um, Mr. Chaplain or anyone else could answer that. Mr. Chapter? I, I think the honest answer is we don't know yet, Ms. Mahan. We're still awaiting 
that guidance from the federal government in regards to the specificity of what we can spend the uh, American Rescue Act funds on. Um, it's not clear to me we'll be able to spend it on affordable housing, so I, I don't. Um, I'm not. I'm not trying to sort of uh, gloss over, but I, we we just don't know yet. I've been on every week. I'm on another call with another group, hoping that there's some information. And I was even on a call with Senator Warren directly last Thursday, and even her and her staff don't really know what the money can be spent on yet. Okay, I, I guess I would, um, not I guess, I, I definitely would be interested in what my um, colleagues have to say on this, but it just seems like every time we turn around, we'll find another way to tax uh, residents or future residents in Arlington. I think we've gone to them a lot, plus we're talking about going back to the voters um, in the near future for another override. Um, I. My personal opinion think that um, with the Rescue Act that um, that would be a way to fund and give the seed money um, to this affordable housing trust. And again, it's it's one of those things that I always say when you know someone comes before us with a good idea and we ask them where the money's going to come from, and they say, well, we just want to establish it first, and you know, and, and then we'll we'll find a way to pay for it. I, I just don't think it should be on on Arlington taxpayers to fund that again, especially if you want a success for an override in 22 or 23. Which is, uh, maybe with the Rescue Act that goes out 23, 24, but I'm, I just have concerns about that and I'd like to hear from my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not in favor of it right now. This is a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, yeah, I, I, and I think there's a lot of unknowns here right now. I, I think I note as the, the other cities and towns in the Commonwealth that have passed this, none of them have been approved by the legislature. That there are two bills pending in the legislature, one in the Senate, one in the House. Um, Representative Garberly is one of the co-sponsors of the one in the House that would provide a local option. It is slightly different from, from what's being proposed here because it would only require a vote of town meeting. But I mean, I think this is a multi-step process. And, and I think given the vote on the, the trust fund, I'd be willing to, to move the process along. I do think that when it does come up, if it is successful at town meeting and, and goes to the legislature, this board, whoever's on it, um, because this could take many years before, before several years anyway, before this this could happen. It has to be very clear what the fee is um, because right now it's between 0.05% and 2% and, and, and what the exemption amount is, I think it's very important to be clear. But I think it is also good that this, um, it, this proposal actually requires an affirmative vote of, of the Arlington voters as opposed to the the acts before the legislature, which only require a town meeting vote. So it's a multi-step process. I think there'll be a lot of discussion going forward and I'm comfortable moving it forward at this stage, but I I, I am aware of concerns about um, being upfront with what the exemption amounts are, what the percentage is and, and, and what the funds are gonna be used for. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would say, so I'm inclined to move this forward uh, and on a couple of different uh, reasons. Um, first off is the, I think the important characteristic here is that it's something that it goes to the voters. And in the same sense that uh, there, are, you know, there are questions about like whether or not the select board should stop things before they go to town meeting, which of course, most of the time we can't because it's not there. This is one of the things where we can't stop it before going to town meeting, but town meeting could stop it. And I don't think it should. I think uh, town meeting should push it before to voters. In 2019, this board voted to support an override and our commitment was uh, no proposition two and a half overrides for at least four years. And so uh, I would say, and so cl clearly this isn't a proposition two and a half override. So we're certainly following the letter of our commitments, but I would actually also say that we're following the spirit of the commitments on the assumption that this wouldn't actually come before the voters until 2023. And so one of the things I really um, 
espoused as a real positive thing about the last override vote we did is that we did it in conjunction with the high school. And there are a lot of people who, who at the time the council was, you know, separate the votes, Dan, because, um, you know, people aren't going to want to vote for everything all at once. Like you should vote for the taxes, you should vote for these revenue increases one at a time. And what I said, and I still think was the right choice was to give everybody the whole menu and say, this is what it is. This is what, and like, and you have a really expansive, really candid conversation about what it all means. And uh, so I would consider that a, a positive vote tonight and a positive vote at town meeting is setting the table really for a future conversation where we get to look at our overrides. We get to look at the impact of a real estate transfer fee. We get to look at the impact of our other revenue sources. We, make to make, we get to make a decision that's very broad and uh, inclusive about the entire town financial situation. Uh, so I guess actually that I'm gonna, if it's appropriate, Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna put that in the form of a motion uh, I move rec that we recommend positive action on this article. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, I'm, I'm going to second that. Uh, and uh, I, I have a bunch of questions, uh, some for myself um, and one from a town meeting member uh, that I think it'll be good for us to answer uh, because then uh, we can refer them to the video. Uh, with other town meeting members, I think we'll have the same questions. And uh, so um, the first thing though, I guess is uh, a statement uh, uh, regarding uh, the setting of the fee. Uh, I mean, one of the members of the HPIC and I'm the select board liaison to that uh, committee uh, has stated that he thinks there's some ambiguity as to how frequently the select board would set that fee. And he feels, and the committee too feels that we should make it clear, excuse me, we should make it clear that the select board would set that fee once. It wouldn't be the ma a matter of the select board setting that fee uh, every year. I mean, so if we set it at 1%, I mean, that would be it. I mean, I guess at some point in time, we could change it, but it wouldn't be the expectation that 12 months later we'd be changing it again. So uh, if you, think it is necessary, um, and I guess this is through you, Mr. Chair, to uh, Mr. Heim, that we set an amendment, uh, make an amendment. Um, I will do that at the proper time. Mr. Okay. Chair, may I? Yep. Yes, Mr. Diggins, I, I don't know that the way I read what I put in front of you, um, that it, the select board wouldn't have the ability to change the fee at some later point in time. So if you want to put in a specific time frame for how often the fee can be changed or to state that it can be um, set just once, I, I would definitely want to put some sort of language in there to that effect. Yeah. Let's leave that for discussion a, a little bit more. I mean, so, so uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I need to think it through a bit more. I mean, I, I mean, we can't say that we'll never change it. That's for sure. I mean, uh, and so now it's a matter of whether we want to set how frequently we change it. And that may be something that should be discussed I mean, uh, at town meeting you know, or, or, or definitely amongst us some more. Uh, and so then another question I have uh, uh, is, is in, in um, regarding the, the draft. I mean, there's a line in there and the town may not by law, by law or otherwise eliminate or reduce any exemptions set forth in this law. So that means we can never change any of the exemptions? So, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. So, yes, Mr. Diggins, um, I should have noted that one of the other provisions of the draft special legislation would be that, again, contingent on voter approval, that it would authorize the town from time to time to promulgate uh, further bylaws and regulations to sort of flesh out certain details of, of how this should work. Uh, but I think the idea to my understanding is that the things that are exempt are sort of sacred things that are exempt in the special legislation. And in order to alter that, you would have to go back to the legislature and amend this special act that it couldn't just be done even by a vote at town meeting that it would have to be very, very firm for voters that these are the categories of things that are exempt. Got it. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, so so um, 
And unfortunately, I, I don't have the email pulled up. So I'm going to ask you a question and look away while I pull up that email. So uh, the first question the person had was, uh, this is, if we pass it, it goes to uh, the, the um, it goes to the state in, or to the legislature in, and, and they can move it forward uh, or not. Uh, it, if they don't, I mean, or let me let me see if I remember the question correctly. I mean, what are the hurdles to getting them to move it forward? Like, why is it the the current ones that are in front I mean, aren't moving forward in front of the legislature? Aren't moving forward? Attorney Hunt, I'll do my best to answer the question. There are probably a variety of reasons that some board members might have a better pulse on than, than I do. Uh, some of it might be because there's. Uh, proposed local options that might offer more uniformity. Um, the downside, of course, to uniformity is that you, you, it's not specifically tailored to uh, what Arlington is trying to achieve. Um, there may also be, um, or have been at some point, some concerns about, um, I think these, my, my guess is these concerns have lessened about whether or not this um, is a, is it, I think at one point in time it was phrased as, as, as a tax, I believe, by Concord, for example. Whereas now I believe they're being termed as a, a, a real estate transfer fee, um, which addresses a sort of uh, slightly esoteric legal argument that's, uh, that's probably not super uh, important for the board's, you know, sort of consideration of whether or not it's a good idea or a bad idea, but my, my, that's my guess. My guess is that there are probably one concern, a little bit of concern about like, well, if we're gonna do this, should we have the same set of rules for everybody? Hence, uh, Representative Garbley and a few other folks idea of a local option. And I think the other uh, obstacle may have been at one point in time, you know, um, I remember reviewing this and, and noting that at one point in time, Concord had phrased it as a real estate tax which is hard for a local community to assess outside of something that's approved broadly by the state um, versus a fee and some of the modifications and evolutions of these things. Whereas if the money is all getting put into an affordable housing trust established under the general laws that helps to alleviate some concern about um, this idea of, of, of a tax being levied and, and only getting put into a, a very specific um, Pot. Okay, thank you, and, and I'll, I'll add to that too. That you know, I, I think the, the the current ones in front of the legislature have been kind to study, it and and I suspect we, everyone is waiting to see what's going to happen, even either with the enabling um, legislation that's before uh, the legislature, it, or what the governor uh, uh, is is going to do about this, because it seems like everyone wants a piece. Of this, I mean, I heard about it first. I mean, with respect to trying to fund uh, more public transit, and, and and I think the governor did have something in the last um, in up last year, and, and so I, I suspect not until that gets resolved will we get any movement on that home legislation, home rules, home, on the home rule decisions. And so the second um, question. Uh, was, let me just read it instead of trying to sum it out. Um, my reading of this document is that if the home legislation is approved, the select board can set the rate anywhere from 0.5 to 2% and further justice anytime with any additional bylaws and without any further public approval. Is that correct? I mean, and, and I guess that's what's getting at with respect to uh, whether, how frequently we change it. So that'll be up to us to decide how frequently we change it. Um, if this is correct. So by voting yes to this, TMMs will be authorizing 2% home sales above the state median single family average price when not subject to exemption. And so the answer to that is that we can determine up to 2%, but not necessarily 2%. We can be anywhere in between. Correct, Mr. Ch um, Attorney Heim? Yes. So I, I think it's really important to note there are three things that the board has been giving a, a, a discretion to do. And that discretion is within a specific band. You're being, you're giving, if, if this all was, was approved by the voters after the whole process, you'd be given discretion to set the rate 0 0.5 to 2% um, without any further process after 
being approved by the voters, but without any further process, you wouldn't have to go to town meeting, for example, to set the rate at 1% or to change it to 0.75. Uh, the second thing you're being given discretion to do is to decide who's gonna pay, buyer, seller, some combination of both. And then the third thing that you're being given discretion to do is decide how much, uh, what price of a transaction should really trigger this. Do we only want to apply this to million dollar sales? Do we want to apply it to sales over $800,000? Or do we want to apply it to every transaction over $445,000, which would, that number might change. So if the housing market tanks, for example, that number would decrease and you'd be looking at, you know, a much uh, lower average sale price. If the housing market goes crazy and, you know, homes are selling for the average state price is, you know, $700,000, then that floor would creep up. Um, I guess in some ways that would be a good problem to have for folks who are, who are, who are selling, but I understand that that, that 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 piece is 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 what it's in your discretion in terms of where you want the threshold to ultimately be within that, as long as it's above that um, floor. Um, you're not going to be given discretion to pass town bylaws without town meeting approval. So while the special legislation talks about being authorized to pass certain bylaws to sort of flesh this out as necessary. The select board and anybody else would still have to get town meetings approval for anything that's a bylaw. Great, thank you. Two more questions. It, uh, and, and so um, uh, I'm assuming that we can add exemptions, I mean, if we want to. Uh, and one concern this person had is he's selling a property you know, in town and then buying another one in town. And I imagine this is something that some seniors I mean, um, might encounter I me mean, where they have a, a large house or whatever, they don't need that much house and they want to buy something smaller in town uh, within a limited amount of time. He, this person didn't see that exemption as one that was listed. He, uh, uh, we, we would be able to add that exemption if we wanted, correct? That's right. So that's the type of exemption that you might want to add by local bylaw. So you've got your sort of sacred list of exemptions that can't be changed without going back to the legislature. And then you've got, you know, your other exemptions that you might pass by town bylaw saying, look, we think that I'm not advocating a position myself. I'm not answering just your question, but look, we, we think this is a good idea, but we really don't want to see people uh, get hit on this twice. So even if the select board decides, I only want the seller to bear this expense. I don't want buyers to bear it because I, I don't want seniors who sell their homes and want to buy in Arlington again to pay this thing twice. But it turns out that either you're concerned in advance or the actual practical experience shows that people are paying it twice because the seller is just adjusting the, the, the purchase price to uh, adjust for that effect. Well, you might say, uh, you know, persons over 65 by bylaw who are um, selling and buying a home within the same 12 month period um, shall be, you know, exempt be a little bit hard to figure out exactly how to do that, but that is something that you could do by bylaw. Great, and um, last question, which is a, a little two-parter. Uh, it's kind of related to that, the person says, who will have the authority to grant waivers? Um, would it be the select board? I mean, does the proposed legislation require that additional bylaws be put in place to manage a waiver process? So, um, I'm not sure in terms of what specific waiver we'd be talking about. So the bylaw, I'm sorry, the, the, the special legislation uh, establishes, um, what is it, A through J in terms of transfers uh, that are exempt. Um, further relief from it, I would think would be something that you'd want to put into a, a, a town bylaw at a, at a minimum okay. um, in terms of granting some sort of waiver process. Okay. So it could be the select board. It could be that you have another process for doing that, but but I would think you'd want to uh, detail that further. All right. Well, well, thanks for answering other questions and I thank my colleagues for in, indulging.
and those questions to it. And and I'll, all I'll, I'll add is that it it takes it takes some money to run a society, you know, and 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 we really do want to help those who can't afford in housing because one way or another we're going to pay for it. And either we pay to help people out, and, or we 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 pay to watch them suffer. Uh, uh, and so, uh, uh, so that's why it's easy for me to um, support this. Thank you. Yep. And I just say that I do certainly understand the hesitation amongst homeowners in town to enact such a legislation where they, their house is one of their biggest assets and for many people their retirement. But you know, as we go out in and talk to residents, affordable housing is the critical issue that people are talking about, the issue that they want action from the town, from town meeting and this board on. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of residents who are really excited about the affordable housing trust. And this is one step to try to get the trust going and make the trust effective. And as Mr. Corsi said, this is just a first step in a long process that ultimately ends up with the voters of the town before we can enact any sort of legislation regarding the transfer fee. Um, Attorney Hyman, just, just one question, just the way this works, my attorney, my closing attorney had on, how does the, the fee get paid in other localities? Is it at closing? Is it, do, is it billed to the individual? Is it assessed against the house? So, um, or does it have to be worked out? So I think there's, um, we would use basically our existing methods for collecting. So if you, um, you're, you're more familiar with uh, how, how this practically shakes out than I am, Mr. Hurd, but um, it, essentially, you know, it would probably have to be baked in to uh, uh, something on the sort of checklist that buyers and sellers have to do before they get their um, certificate from the town saying that there's no sort of lien on it. And if there's, um, an outstanding balance, uh, it would be a potentially lienable thing against um, the, the home. So it'll probably be some combination of incentivizing uh, buyers to make sure that it is dealt with at closing and uh, the municipal lien certificate process, the sort of checklist that we have for making sure that you know all those things um, are clear when the final sort of transfer is made. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, I think we'll have plenty of time to perfect the process. It just, you know, ninety-seven percent of purchases, the attorney gets an MLC. In some, you know, cash deals or private deals they don't and just I, I just want to make sure that we can as we work this through we avoid situations where buyers buy a property and find out that they have a lien for this amount sitting on their property because they didn't know about it their closing attorney didn't know about it because it's specific to one locality and they kind of cause he headaches on the back end of that but I think that's something that we certainly have some time to work out it's a good point I'll, I'll definitely uh uh do a little bit more thinking with the treasurer's office some other folks on it. All right. With that, this is a public hearing. If any members of the public would like to speak on this issue, please use the raise hand function on your Zoom application. We do have a few phone in. So Mr. Chaplin, can you remind me what the raise hand process is for a phone in participant? I believe it's star nine. Star nine. So star nine on your phone, raise hand function on your Zoom application. We have no members of the public wishing to speak on this one, so I will go back to the board for any additional comments or questions. Mrs. Mahan? I guess since it's, it's just the beginning of the process, I will vote in favor of it, but I also will reemphasize as well as make a request, reemphasize if we 
can um, fund the affordable um, housing trust through the Rescue Act monies. Um, I'd like that to be an option. And if, if that's the way we can go, I'd like to do that instead of imposing another tax on um, Arlington taxpayers, whether they're current or future. And then um, my second request would be um, through the chair to the town manager that um, if we do if we are able to obtain this pool of money, whether through the Rescue Act or imposing another tax on Arlington residents, um, I'd like to see from the planning department within the next two or three months, sort of, if they were to receive these funds with a 0.5 or 2% um, cat increase on sales, um, what they have identified. I don't want to go through what I've gone through with CDBG, that money's come in and we have six close to seven figures of money that are unprogrammed funds. Um, so I would like to see a plan of what the planning department, and I know ENDS worker has been ridiculously great on this, but unfortunately I think we don't have her anymore. I think she went somewhere else and is a planning director somewhere else. Um, I'd like to know, I, I don't, my thing that I'm fearful of is A, imposing the tax and then B, um, collecting the money and it sits there as unencumbered, free cash, unprogrammed, whatever word you want to use funds. Um, and, and if the planning department doesn't have a viable plan, um, on how to spend these funds if we can collect them, whether through the Recovery Act or an additional tax, as well as an override, which would go to something else, then maybe we need to reevaluate. So I'm willing to vote for this initially, but I, I had a lot of questions because um, I'm just looking at, I'm trying to think of where in the town that the planning department um, would be able to use this large amount of funds and I just don't see it. And uh, I think Mount Gaboa and or the sale of that also needs to come into the discussions we have in the future. So I, I just wanna put that forward. I'm just very concerned with going to the voters, going to the voters, override exclusion. And now we have Community Preservation Act. And now this is another tax increase I wish Dan would help me out. You're the libertarian. <laughs> but um, I don't think we can just keep looking to Arlington residents as Arlington's ATM to do this. So um, if this does move forward. I'd really like to see something from the planning department, what vision they have and what they think they can acquire for affordable housing um, and or town properties that are already under our control, like Mount Gilboa, which has been a sweetheart deal, in my opinion, not all years, but for some years. So uh, I really want something out of the planning department to, uh, if they get 0.5 or up to 2% from whoever, where they're gonna spend that money and or if they don't have a plan to spend it. So I don't mean to be negative, but I just, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just really cognizant of, turning to the taxpayers for everything when, uh, especially in these current times, which I don't think we're gonna see the light at the end of the tunnel until at the earliest 2023. So that's, that's, those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just a few more comments. I, and I'm gonna support Mr. Dunn's motion. Um, and, and just to, to Mrs. Mahan's comment, there, there is a provision in the act that, that requires an annual report in terms of what was received and where the money was spent and whether it's being, how it's being spent, is it efficient? Is it, it, it uh, are there other ways to spend it? So I think going forward that there is that requirement if this was ever approved, um, passed a town meeting, approved by the legislature and approved by the voters. The thing that does concern me, and, and again, I'm willing to go along with the language here. I, I am concerned about maybe pro providing a little bit more certainty as to what ultimately the amount is that's gonna be asked for both the, 
the percent of the, the and I'm going to call it a fee because it is a it is a fee and I, and I know people will look at it and say fee or tax you're still asking people to pay more money but it, technically it is a fee on on the sale of a property um I I almost think and I, and I think this is worthy of discussion even at town meeting as to the changes in each year we know the way this is written it's between 0.05 percent and two percent so that's the the limitations on it I, I wonder if that determination, if there's a change, shouldn't be made by town meeting, not by the select board. I'm not, I don't want to make the change here. I think we go forward and we have that discussion, but I think that that is consistent with what the, the, the two acts that the legislature call for. It's the legislative body that determines it, not the executive branch. Um, and, and I also um, you know, think when the time comes that, that there has to be certainty on the exemption amount. And, and we know it's at least going to be 445,000. I would imagine it's going to be an amount um, perhaps higher than that um, a, a few years out. But I think it's it's important to lay that out, not, not have that as an unknown from year to year. So um, I'm comfortable with moving this forward and having, uh, putting this before town meeting, but I did want to just raise those two concerns in terms of what happens if it's implemented. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. No additional comment, thank you. Mr. Diggins? Well, I'm, I'm all in favor, thank you, Mr. Chair, I'm all in favor of, of a, a plan and, and having some idea how the monies will be spent. And uh, I, I don't want to say, offer some ideas now because they might be out of bounds of I mean, what's really possible and we want to get people's expectations up uh, but but I'll, it, I, I will say it, it'll be hopefully we can get some sense of the scale of the problem because as much as I support this a, a, the real issue being is poverty and, and we've really got to solve for that and, uh, uh, and I kind of misstated what I said earlier I said we can pay by helping people out or we can pay to watch them suffer. What I really meant is that we cannot pay and watch them suffer. And that's a cost I mean, to all of us. You know, and I don't think it's a cost that we, we really want to keep paying. Uh, and as long as I'm around in whatever position and I'm really going to be pushing that we try to solve the poverty issue because we, it's not enough really to say we're going to give you money to help you afford a house, but now you can't really afford the food and you can't afford education, you can't afford I mean, health care. We really have to work at that. I mean, it's gonna cost, it's gonna take money from all of us who have some I mean, to those who have a whole lot less. So that's why I support even these incremental um, acts because at least we're trying to do something. So so I encourage us to keep trying. My voice is a little raspy, I'm not <laughs> that emotional. <laughs> so so um, just something caught in my throat, a little tired. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, again, I'll support the motion. It's, it's the first step in the process, and this is an issue that's really near and dear to people in Arlington to try to help fight an affordable housing crisis. I want to thank Attorney Heim for providing us with the framework. And for anyone that's looking, just know that, as my colleagues have said, this is the beginning of a long discussion as to figure out what those figures are so you don't have to necessarily be scared off by the figures that you see there. I think we as a board as a community can come up with whatever the appropriate amount is if we move this forward. So with that, Attorney Heim, we have a motion to approve. It's been seconded. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I make one note? Yep. Um, there's just a, if the board is comfortable with the uh, vote and comment uh, that was sort of drafted, I can either proceed that way or I can uh, draft a uh, comment that reflects tonight's discussion with a little bit more nuance. Um, in either case, the proposed vote that I put in front of you in section two, uh, the Housing Plan Implementation Committee updated their recommendation. In section two, where they set the statewide median sale price of a single family as the threshold, they asked to strike the language reading for the prior 12 months from the date of the select board's determination. Basically, that just means that they're not anchoring into a 12 month period anymore. I, I, I'm not exactly sure as to what the rationale was, but both in their recommended version and the recommended version that I sort of adapted for you, 
the basically language being stricken uh, would just be the reference to the 12 month period. I guess DHCD reports on whatever the statewide median sale price was and the 12 month uh, piece of it isn't is in, integral for you to have in the uh, legislation. Okay. Any board members have any thoughts on Mr. Sure. Hands? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Dunn? Um, I'm curious if, so it would be my, um, I would like to suggest that we include a reference to our commitment of the 2019 override and talk about that timeline and remind that I think, I, I personally think that reminding people of those commitments and the fact that we're sticking with them is a positive thing. And uh, rep, and I like being repeating that message. So I would be inclined to um, change the comment and include that reference. But uh, if the rest of the board doesn't agree that I'm, I'm, I won't be upset. Any additional comments from board members? Mr. Diggins? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with um, changing the comments and giving uh, the, uh, the town council time to um, uh, add more nuance to the comments and to uh, reflect what's happened in, in this hearing. Yep. Thank you. All right, so I think we can do it. Yep, Mrs. Mahan? Um, I'm fine with what my colleague, Mr. Dunn, said. Um, I'm just going to add um, I would like to um, include my comments or request that uh, if rescue funds through the federal program that, that we're looking into, if that instead of this um, tax or fee, that that could be a source to fund it, as well as I'd like to strengthen up the language that the planning department really has to come up with a framework of the 0.5 to 2% um, monies that could be collected that they really have to come up with. Um, so they're not banking money, which I've seen happen ad infinitum. Um, in order for that, the board or the voters to uh, consider what that tax or fee should be 0.5 to 2%, that the planning department comes up with a viable um, plan on uh, how those monies and where those monies in Arlington, which is extremely dense. <clears throat> I'd like to ask a lot of these people that, oh, I'm so pro affordable housing that are living in one to almost $2 million homes if uh, they wanna sell them at cost and allow us to use them as affordable housing. And I think the answer is no. So I'd like, if, if possible, if my, um, if my colleagues don't agree, that's fine. I still want it in because I'm asking as an individual board member that um, we need to in determining if town meeting and the taxpayers do vote for this, whether it's 0.5 or 2 percent. The planning department really can't bank this money in unencumbered funds, free cash, unprogrammed funds, or any other term. They need to uh, come up with a, a reasonable and viable plan on how to spend them. And if that isn't obtainable, which I would totally understand because I don't know where we're going to look to do this, then um, we can't impose that tax or fee. Thank you. Mr. Corsi? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with the individual comments being added to, to Mr. Dunn's and, 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 and Mrs. Mahan's. And um, I, I have no further comments. Yeah, so I try. I think the question is whether or not to, you, you want to include our comments from tonight. So you can include these comments and any comments that, that you've heard from the board during the course of the discussion um, in the final report. So that works for us. So what I will do, assuming the board votes positively, Mr. Chair, is I will uh, adapt the comment to include these additional pieces and have that be in the draft select board report. For me. Yes. Just to be clear, though, this won't come back for a final vote and comment at a separate agenda item. It'll just be okay. Great. All right. I think we have our vote. Mrs. Yeah. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Five zero vote. Thank you. Article 27, revolving funds. 
Jeffrey. Yes, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, this is the annual authorization for spending out of, the, uh, excuse me, the town's revolving funds. Uh, the key things to look at are what the uh, expenditure limits are. That's what's actually being reauthorized each year. Uh, what had been provided to the board in the agenda packet last Thursday um, was accurate, but all for one of the revolving funds, which is the field user fee fund. Uh, an updated copy was sent to the board's office today uh, that had been listed at an $80,000 expenditure amount. We'd like to increase that to a $100,000 expenditure amount as both the director of public works and the director of recreation feel that that more closely aligns with what we expect to expend uh, out of the field user fee fund for, uh, for the fields in town. Um, otherwise, again, this is an annually recurring authorization uh, that um, the board approves and then is, of course, brought to a town meeting for approval. All right, Mr. Dunn. Uh, move approval, no comment, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Corsi? Second. Mrs. Mahan? Uh, no questions, thank you. Ms. Diggins? No questions, thanks. All right, this is a public hearing. If any members of the public wish to speak, they can use the raise hand function on the Zoom application. Seeing none, we have a motion to approve. Attorney Hyman? This is Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Five zero vote. Well, that's a Warren article hearing. Article 52, endorsement of parking benefit district expenditures. Mr. Chaplin. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. So as the board recalls with the establishment installation of parking meters in Arlington Center several years ago now, part of the entire plan was being able to generate enough revenue to create parking benefit district and thereby reinvest in Arlington Center and its transportation infrastructure uh, and sort of associated uh, benefits to the district. Uh, to date, the biggest and best thing we've been able to do is put uh, approximately $180,000 out of the parking benefit district towards uh, the sidewalk, uh, the center sidewalk project that was completed last year. Uh, so that was a real, uh, I think, significant achievement on the part of the benefit district and this board's wisdom in establishing it. Um, however, over the last year, um, as we have suffered in many ways from the pandemic, parking revenues have suffered um, and um, we still incurred a great deal of the costs associated with the meters and parking control officers, but we weren't generating as much revenue uh, because we all collectively made the proactive decision to cease with metering during the height of the pandemic. Um, as the board knows, uh, metering has once again started. Um, we've also rolled out pay by phone. Uh, so we have further options for people to be able to, to pay for parking. Um, but we, so last year was not a good financial year for the parking fund or the parking benefit district. We still have residual balances uh, unexpended from prior years. And we expect a rebound uh, next year in terms of parking revenue, but nevertheless, the Parking Advisory Committee um, agreed with my advice that we should budget very conservatively for expenditures to come out of the parking fund for the Parking Benefit District. And the only expenditure we're asking for authorization for this year is $20,000 for plantings in Arlington Center. There's 12 large planters that were installed, I believe in 2019, uh, that we could contract with a local company to change them out four times a year, once for each season, with seasonally appropriate plantings. And these funds would go towards that and potentially some further plantings um, around Arlington Center. It's very much appreciated by the businesses. Um, it's something that even, uh, again, in the grips of the pandemic, people commented on when they were able to walk seeing, um, seeing these planters nicely uh, cared for and nicely planted. Uh, so we're asking for approval for $20,000 for next year to continue that planting program. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move for approval. Thank you. Mr. Corsi. Second. Mr. Dunn. Uh, no comment. Thank you. Yep. Mrs. Mahan. Uh, no questions. Thank you. I'll only make one comment. I feel like I've said this before, but it's funny to me that this part idea of the parking benefits district was promulgated by the 
vendor, the representative of the vendor trying to sell us parking meters. He's like, oh, you know what you could do? You could create this district. And it's really been successful. It, it, you know, we implemented the meters to create parking spaces, not to create revenue for the town. And uh, it was a re really a great idea that we built on. And it's done a lot for Arlington Center and we'll continue to do so. So happy to endorse it. With that, this is a public hearing. If any members of the public wish to speak on this article, they can use the raise hand function on the Zoom application now. Seeing none, Attorney Ammon, we have a motion to approve. It's been seconded. Mrs. Mohan. Yes, thank you. Mr. McCorsey. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Thank you. That closes warrant article hearings. 2021. Final votes and comments. We have articles for review. Article 7, Article 16, Article 20, Article 21, Article 23, Article 24, Article 79, Article 81, 80, Article 86, Article 89, and Article 90. So I will go through them one by one. Just call out if you want to make any corrections or modifications to the article. Article 7, Article 16, Article 20, Article 21, Article 23, Article 24, Article 79, Article 81, Article 86, Article 89, and Article 90. Mr. Chair? Yes. I'm sorry, I do have a, a brief uh, note, a few notes on Article 89. Uh, yes. The board directed me to work with the article proponent, Ms. Walachek. She did provide uh, a few um, corrections to dates uh, on the proposed resolution and uh, really noted something that I just wanted to highlight to the board that I thought was uh, terrific for addition. She noted uh, that the following language would be nice to insert into the resolution if the board is, is accept finds acceptable, I'll put it in. Uh, that in addition to a, a petition in the general court uh, to, for the abolition of slavery, uh, that Prince Hall was, quote, the first American to publicly use the language of the Declaration of Independence for political purposes other than justifying the war against Britain. So she uh, was hoping that that could be added. She had a few other corrections that she was asking for with respect to uh, naming Prince Hall by his full name throughout the resolution, which seems perfectly reasonable. And again, correcting a few dates, there's also some minor historical stuff that I, it's not, uh, about Prince Hall being a minister. So I, I've, I've taken out a few of those sort of historical uh, citations if they weren't clearly supported by some record. Um, so if the board finds those changes acceptable, I'll, I'll just incorporate them into the final final vote. All right, so we'll look for a motion to approve with the modifications as just outlined by Attorney Hyde, Mrs. Corsi. That's so much. And Mrs. Mahan. Second, thank you. Mrs. Dunn. Uh, no comment. Th um, thank you, for, Mr. Heim, for all the hard work. Mr. Higgins. No comments. Yeah. Attorney Heim, we have a motion to approve that has been seconded. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's a five to vote and my personal thanks to a lot of proponents and uh, to the election modernization committee for their patience as I was trying to uh, sort some of these details out in my own head, uh, as well as of course to the board for a lot of uh, terrific feedback on different drafts of the version list. Thank you. Thank you. And that will take us to new business, Attorney Heim. Just one piece of new business. Uh, I attended a terrific CLE today um, uh, with a number of folks in the uh, law enforcement and, and civil rights community, including uh, Senator Brownsberger, for a sort of comprehensive continuing legal ed education course on the police reform bill. Um, there were a lot of really uh, interesting discussions about details of it. Uh, Judge Hines uh, was also a part of the panel. Um, I'll look forward to uh, maybe providing, to, to thinking about with the chair, or, uh, the next chair, the, the, the right uh, way in which to sort of summarize what's a really, really, really long 102 section bill uh, for the select board and, and, and the public as, as, as you folks are interested. Thank you. Mr. Chaplin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, one brief piece of new business as the board knows and those subscribing to town notices know, uh, last week the town issued um, the town manager's annual budget and financial plan, which is the product of a great deal of work by the deputy town manager, Sandy Pooler, management analyst, Julie Wayman, and all the various department heads contributing to that document. Um, it's, it's a big document. Uh, it is a lot to dive into, but for those who are interested, there is a great deal of information about the town's revenues, expenses, narrative description of town uh, departments, goals and objectives and accomplishments, workload indicators, organizational charts. So um, it really is an informative document about both town budgeting, town policy, and town operations. Uh, it's available on the website if anybody would like to look at it. And I just wanted to call attention to that. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. So uh, my new business is just to um, say this ends um, my, um, my freshman year on the select board. And, and uh, it, I liked you all uh, before I got on this board and I like you all even more. And I really appreciate all of your patience to me and, and, and guidance to me. And, uh, and whenever I had a question and reached out to you all, you, you, you answered and you reached out to me uh, when you had questions. And I also want to thank the town manager, me and my week um, gets off to a great start every Monday morning at 8.30 when we uh, have a half hour conversation about usually questions that I have and I get his input on on various things. I mean, uh, and so uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity. I look forward to two more years and, and to Mr. Dunn. Be, uh, when I was running, my only regret was that uh, you were leaving, and, uh, but, but you're back. And so as you leave again, I give you this poem. My dear Mr. Dunn, it sure has been fun. Like a mid-July P-Town sun, this tour with you ranks number one. Well, Thank Dick you Carson, very much. Follow that one. Uh, um, I don't have a poem, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I do have a couple pieces. Well done, Mr. Biggins. I, um, first of all, I, I did want to thank Mr. Dunn. He came, came on board again February 22nd. And th this is the second time I'm thanking him for his service and, and telling him how much I enjoyed working with him. But uh, this year it was on short, uh, a very short period of time. And, and Dan, you, you really came in. We had some long hearings and you did a great job, added a ton to the board. So thank you very much for, for, your, for your service. And I also want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for your for your work as chairman this past year. You, um, as you said tonight, you never got to use the gavel in, 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 the, in the chamber. Every meeting was run remotely, which is a, a real challenge in itself. And, and I thought you did a great job with that under, under very challenging circumstances. And, and I really appreciate the leadership that you provided to the board and to us over this past year. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Um, I know I had something for new business, but that poem kind of knocked it. Um, oh, I do remember. Um, first, I will thank Mr. Dunn for um, coming back and joining us. Um, I know we have our past history in terms of your feelings about me and my uh, patience to serve on the board, which you didn't think I have, but I do. But I definitely do appreciate, I, I said to the manager today that my uh, PCP diagnosed me with um, SBFS, which is select board fatigue syndrome. That's a syndrome where you're a member of the select board and you meet every Monday night, uh, sometimes going into the next day. And I don't think Mr. Dunn uh, really knew that's what he was signing on to. So I, I do appreciate that. And I have enjoyed your presence at the meeting. So um, I thank you on that. To the um, and I mean that sincerely. I know I'm, you know, I sent a little shot across the bow. I had to get that in. Um, but I, I do appreciate you doing that because um, you also have your business and family commitments um, and that's taking away from that. Uh, to the incoming chairperson, and dare I say chairman, because I'm not the incoming chairman. So it's a chairman, not a chairperson, a woman. Um, what I'd like to put forth to the incoming Chairman, as well as um, my colleagues and future colleagues, um, I know the uh, 
law that went through the state house regarding the Allentown Housing Authority and the resident appointment has pretty much been refined and laid out. And it would be my personal wish, and I'm not saying it's not any of my colleagues' wish also, that um, uh, we, it, it's sort of in limbo with the resident, which is um, Fiorella Bedelia that we appointed um, in terms of whether we appoint her again to continue on for a number of years or not. I'd like to uh, have that on uh, the quickest future agenda that we can um, and I'm not sure how the process goes, if we can just vote her and keep her on, or if we need to open the process and if we do again, but I, I, I really think fear, I know Fira, um, I've been in uh, limited contact with her, um, along with Nick Metropolis, um, who she's been working with and Joanne Preston. Um, I'd like to really kind of cement that and get that taken care of. I hope it's Fiorella, but if the process says we have to reopen it again and accept other residents who are interested, then we should do that. But I'd really like to, to the future chairperson, um, make sure we take care of that at the, at the first uh, meeting we can under the uh, LAR as uh, designated. So thank you. Okay, Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so first off, reminder to everybody that uh, it's election day on Saturday. Uh, tomorrow is your last day to request a ballot if you wish to do uh, early voting or absentee voting. Um, and that ballot has to be dropped off by uh, Saturday, uh, which is, of course, you can vote in person on Saturday. And you can also drop off your ballot on Saturday. And uh, good luck to all of the candidates. That is my uh, first item. Uh, the second item is, uh, so the last time I, I, I did a farewell speech, I gave a really long list of uh, thank yous and all of the thank yous I gave are still true. Um, town employees, town volunteers, voters, colleagues, everyone. Still the great people that you were uh, when I left a year ago. Uh, tonight though, I wanna focus on the town manager. It's easy to forget how good he is at his job and how skilled he is at putting this $180 million business running. Uh, there are dozens of projects and initiatives running at all times. He knows every, every controversial issue, every difficult call makes it to his desk somewhere along the way. He's got more than a dozen department heads. He has bargaining units, he has committees, he has citizens. Not least in his list of challenges is the five of us. On February 8th, uh, which was before I got on uh, back on the board, there was a vote of this board unanimously in support of his leadership. I'm really grateful and gratified that we all agree on this. And uh, that unanimous vote is really important. The way the law works, all it really takes to retain the manager is a majority vote, but as a practical matter, it's possible for a single member to undercut or undermine a majority decision. It's possible for a dissenter to make the manager's job harder or just plain unpleasant. But with the unanimous board, we can work together as a team to guide and support the manager. And so I leave the board again, knowing that the town is in good hands. Thank you all for uh, putting me back on. I've enjoyed the last few weeks and I'm gonna enjoy the next few weeks too. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Dunn, for your willingness to serve. I think as was mentioned, we might've undersold the amount of time that you're gonna have to spend here, but that's okay. I, I know. You, you love serving, so and happy to have you here. Um, I just want to thank the whole board for helping me this year. It's been a difficult year to take my first role as chair, but you know, with members that support me, it really makes it that much easier. I want to thank the town manager for all his help. We had a lot of conversations, a number of them after hours on weekends, just because we had time critical issues. He's always available, and I want to thank. Attorney Heim, I've had many, many, many conversations with Attorney Heim, and a lot of them have also been after hours on weekends, and and it's, he's really been a great help in helping me navigate the agendas and uh, and get through this first year under odd circumstances. I want to thank Marie, Ashley, Lauren, and Fran, who has recently departed us in the select board's office for all the work that they do which is incredible the amount of back end work that they do to put our meetings together and, uh, and keep, really keep the town running 
from that aspect in our office. So they, they do a ton of work and certainly underappreciated sometimes. So I want to thank them for everything that they did. And just say, you know, I, I love serving on this board. I enjoy serving on the board. I hope to continue to serve on the board in the event that I do not. I know that the, the board will continue in you know, five sets of capable hands. But um, it really has been a privilege and honor to serve on the board. And I hope to see you next Monday. With that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded by? Second. Second. Mr. Diggins. So Attorney High, we have a motion to adjourn. This has been seconded. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Burry. Oh, and see if we're going to put it in. <laughs> we're adjourned. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Good night, everybody. Thank you.